أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونستعين ونستغفره ونأوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مدل له ومن يدلل فلا هادي له نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بشيرا ونذيرا والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين مولانا أب القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المأسومين المذلومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا فقد قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا إن جاءكم فاسق بنبأ فتبينوا أن تصيبوا قوما بجهالة فتصبحوا بجهالة فتصبحوا على ما فعلتم نادمين صلاة على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته It's actually nice to see myself in the camera at the onset, I'd like to begin by ext extending my gratitude to the people of Edmonton and in particular to Islamic uh, ISIA and also to the executive members and for all of you for showing your support uh, and providing your assistance towards the Fort McMurray evacuees. And it seems the weather is getting better, so we'll be your guest for only a short while. But we really do appreciate uh, all the help that you have thus far shown. And if you ever find yourself in Fort McMurray, our houses are there, they're open for all of you. We are all not millionaires, as they say, but uh, we, are, we will be there if you should need any help. The, I think the president, Brother Hash Farid, requested that I say a few words uh, this Thursday. And so I agreed, but there wasn't any specific uh, topic that was given to me. So I thought a little bit of what I should say. And then I remembered what uh, Samahat al-Shaykh Bhimji in his lecture uh, during the wiladat, Maulud of Haz uh, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas he, oh, he made an interesting point and I'd like to expand on that point with his permission. The point that he made was of all the children, of all the sons of Imam Ali alayhi salam from his wives after Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam. Oh. Abu al Fadl al Abbas has a distinguished state, distinguished personality. He is a little bit apart from the rest. Why is that? Imam Ali alayhi salam had a lot of sons, a lot of children, a lot of sons. And they were all loyal, they were all good children. But Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas is set, a, set aside. He is a little bit different. Why? What did he accomplish in his life? If you look at the history books, some of you might be surprised to know that, at least if you read the primary uh, historical uh, narratives, there's actually very little about him. Perhaps if you could compile all the historical books, perhaps you could compile a one-page biography 
a little bit or more, a little bit less. In fact, his other brothers, like Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya, there's a lot about him that we know, prior to the event of Karbala and after. But yet, despite his relatively unknown status, prior to the event of Karbala, after the event of Karbala, overnight as we say, he becomes the paragon of loyalty, of courage. And everybody's talking about him. Even today, despite the fact that there is so much, uh, so little that we know about him, I'm sure you know thousands of lines of poetry about him. Why is that? What did he accomplish that the other siblings or other people during the time of Imam Hussain could not accomplish or didn't accomplish? You know, I remember last year I went to the ziyarat during the Arba'in season and, and I was in Najaf and I tried very hard to reach the shrine of Imam Ali alayhi salam with some strategic planning what's the best time to go there you know, what's the best route? I was able finally to touch the shrine of Imam Ali alayhi salam. And then, right a few days before Arba'in, with some difficulty, I was able to touch the, stri- the shrine of Imam Hussain alayhi salam. But believe me, I was not able to touch the shrine of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, unless I wanted to come out on a stretcher. That's how difficult it was for me to reach his shrine. And only after a few days, uh, after the Arba'in period, I was finally able to uh, touch his blessed shrine. Why is that? Why is this, this craze, this passion, this love for him? What did he do apart from the other companions and family members? When Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, when he was leaving towards Karbala, he wrote a risala, a short letter to the Bani Hashim, to his family members, to his friends. In that letter, it's only a few lines, I think it's a two lines letter. It's very short. He says, Inna man bi, That whomsoever joins me in this path is tushhid, will be martyred, will be killed. Wa man lam yalhiq bi, and whomever, whomsoever doesn't join me, Lam Yudrik al Fatih, he will not attain victory. He will not attain success. This letter was for everyone. So from this letter, we know for a fact that the Imam and those that followed him, they knew quite well what was to happen. When a small band of followers, small band of helpless people, face an army of a thousand, you bet there's going to be a massacre. They all knew this. They all knew this, that there will be a massacre. But they still went. Why? Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas still went. And he was loyal till the last breath. Why? What did they understand that the other people couldn't understand? You know, there are many people in, the, in Medina, for example, who were good people, you know, some good companions of the Prophet. And they said to Imam al Hussein, you know, you're going on the invitation of the people, the people of Kufa, you know, these are the same people that betrayed your father. And these are the same people that betrayed your brother when he, did, when he needed them the most. So what do you think they're going to do to you? But Imam still went. Why? The followers, his, his comrades went alongside of him. What did they know that the others didn't know? Why didn't the other companions, some, some, some prestigious companions, like for example, Abdullah ibn Abbas, or other relatives, why didn't they join this uh, caravan? I think 
in addition to many other reasons, I think there could be two reasons. One was the inability of the people to see the bigger picture. The people in Medina, they said, listen, you guys are a small group of people. Perhaps we could muster a force of a thousand or so. But still, at the end of the day, we'll be facing an army and it's not going to end well. It's a wane effort, a wane cause to die in wane. But Imam al Hussein and his followers, they could see the bigger picture. They did not confine themselves to these details. It, was, it wasn't a battle of numbers. It wasn't a battle of who had the better weapons. It wasn't even a physical battle. It was a spiritual battle. It was the battle for the soul of the Muslim Ummah. And Imam Hussain and his companions, they knew that the only way to awaken the sleeping people who are deep in slumber is through their martyrdom. Only then they will be awakened. They knew this. While the others didn't know. So, they saw the bigger picture. They saw the bigger picture, while others couldn't see that bigger picture. They only saw the physical dimension. And the other reason, I think, is the subversive and the prevalent propaganda that people became victim to. You know, people at that time, they used to say, well, this, this Imam, this Hussein, he's just, you know, he's just a rebel. He's out there for himself. He just wants the power. Naudhu Billah. This is what some people thought because of the prevalent Umayyad propaganda. So people could not lend Imam Hussain the assistance that he needed because they couldn't see the big picture and they became victims to Umayyad propaganda. And how is this relevant to us today? How is not being able to see the big picture and not being susceptible to propaganda relevant to us today? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa alayhi wa Imam Jafar Sadiq alayhi salam When somebody uh, asked him to mention some qualities of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, one of the qualities he described him as uh, Nafat al-Basira, that somebody who has a piercing or penetrative uh, sight, who has clear sighted, he who's very clear sighted, meaning who has the ability to see right through the thick fog, who has the ability to see the bigger picture, who has the ability not to scum to propaganda. That is somebody who has basira. And the reason, the reason these two qualities, to be able to see the bigger picture and to not to be susceptible to propagate. The reason it's so important to us, the reason it's relevant for us today, is because we live in a world, a fast-paced world, a world of internet, fast-paced communications, Facebook, of Twitter, and there is so much proliferation of information. It's difficult to know what is right and what is wrong. It's difficult to filter out the useful information, to filter in the useful information and to filter out the useless information. In communications, we have this thing called signal to noise ratio. Okay? 
signal would mean useful information and noise is useless information. The greater the signal to noise ratio, the better you are. The, the worse the signal to noise ratio, the worse you are. What do I mean by that? Imagine you are in a room and you're having a conversation with somebody and you're focusing on what they're saying, meaning that's the signal. Okay, that's the relevant part. You need to focus as to what he's saying. And it's a quiet room. So in this case, the signal to, uh, to the, the, the noise ratio is high. But just open the window a little bit. You'll start hearing cars go by, sirens. You open the door, allow people to come. It's a crowded room. Now what happens? There's lots of noise. Now, the signal to noise ratio goes down because you're not able to focus. The noise around that signal is distracting you. You're not able to focus to the relevant information. And this is the present situation. We have thousands, thousands of TV networks, TV channels, thousands of web blogs, and Facebook pages and Twitter feeds. That's a lot of information. That's a lot of information. And many of us sometimes are overburdened with information overload. We have too much information. If we want to make sure that we are able to see the bigger picture, the reality, we need to make sure that we filter out some of that information. Because not all information is useful information. Most information is useless information. It's irrelevant information. In some case, false information. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallallahu alayhi wa There is this Lebanese uh, statistician, uh, mathematician, sorry, Nasim Talib. He has written a lot of, uh, in this regard, about being able to pick out the proper information. He has a technique, or he has a motto as he goes by. Less is more. Right. The more information you get, the more noise you get. The less information you get, the less noise you get. Some people think by reading 10, 20 articles from 10, 20 different sources, that they are somehow more informed. But the reality is opposite. You could be more informed about the reality with only one or two information sources. You know, there are some people called, you know, I'm not sure if you've heard of this expression, news junkies, right? People who are constantly on the net, constantly reading news. But if you ask them, you know, wait a minute, could you analyze what you've read? They won't be able to do so. Why? Too much information. Too much irrelevant information. Information overload. So we need to make sure, if we want to see the big picture, that we limit the information that we receive. Or else it will be overburden us, it will, we will drown in that information. Imagine yourself, you're walking, you know, you're a pedestrian, you're crossing the street, and you are paying attention to the, the, the details of the road, the pavement, you're paying attention to the other pedestrians, the, their eye colors, when you should be paying attention to whether or not there's a big truck heading your way. Right? That's the useful information. Not the eye color of other pedestrians. We have to make sure that we don't miss the elephant in the room. That we filter out that useless information, which is the majority of that information. And once we, once we get that useful information, what do we do? What is the next step? We have to make sure that we analyze that information. Because not all information is accurate, right? There's a lot of misinformation, there's a lot of disinformation. And so we have to make sure that we analyze that limited amount of information that we've received. 
Brothers, we have to, brothers and sisters, we have to understand that this world that we're living in, it's an interconnected world. Correct? A po policies of one country have a direct impact to the policies of another country. Economic realities have an impact to the, poli to, to the political policies, which are affected by the underlying ideological factors. So everything is connected. So when we do look at an information, when we look at that limited information that we have accumulated, we have to make sure that we look at it holistically. We take everything into perspective. As an example, I don't know if some of you have ever traded stocks or currencies. I used to do that a little bit. Imagine you are looking at the Apple stocks or shares of Apple, right? And you're looking at the hourly graph, okay? And then you look, the trajectory is downwards, meaning the, the, the share value is losing price. And then you start selling all the shares. Uh oh, I'm in trouble. I better sell all the shares. But if you had just zoomed out a little bit, looked at the hour, looked at the daily or monthly or yearly graph, you would have realized the trajectory is actually upwards. That was just a noise. So you need to look at the bigger picture. After you have limited that information, you need to look at the bigger picture if you want to succeed. If you want to understand the events in our world the way they should be. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. So what am I trying to say here? What is the point of all of this? Unfortunately, today in the Islamic world, we focus too much on the details. We don't look at the big picture. In fact, sectarianism, I think, precisely is because of this, that people focus too much on the details, but they're unable to see the big picture. That they focus too much on the small differences, but they're unable to see the big commonalities. You know, in the Muslim world, really, all it takes is a YouTube clip or a Facebook page to rile up the Muslims and cause mayhem. Right? Someone sees a video and then he starts sharing that video all over the net, and then panic ensues. So we need to make sure, as Muslims, that we look at the bigger picture. If, if you read any hist history books, any biographies of any individual, whether it be a prophet or an imam or a saint or just an average Joe, anybody, you will see that some good things have been written about that person, some bad things have been written about that person. Nobody is... Uh, history books have been unfair with everybody. Nobody is immune. Even in today's world, no matter how good a person is, how saintly the person is, as soon as that person takes, he comes in the spotlight of the public view, or the person comes into the political world, without any delay, this person is bound to have rumors started about him. There's bound to be character assassinations. There's bound to be false information about this person. So, what do we do? If we take in everything, if we take all the information without filtering the information, then it would appear everybody's bad. There are no good people in the world. Because there's rumors about everybody. Is bad things have been said about everybody, you know. It means everybody is out there for themselves. And nobody is doing anything for the interest of other people. No country, no organization is doing anything for the interest of others. They're all, you know, doing it for their own sake, for their own interest. So everybody's bad. If, if we take in all that information without being selective, without filtering the garbage. 
it would appear that everybody is bad. But do we believe that? Do we believe that everybody's bad? No. Do we as Muslims believe that there are some people who are inherently good? That there are people today, like they were yesterday, like there will be tomorrow, people who are good, who are trying to do good works? Yes, we believe that. Do we believe that there are some people who are bad, who are doing the works of the devil? Yes, there are some people like that. And there are the rest who are you know, in the gray zone, in between, sometimes doing good, sometimes bad. But we do believe that there are good people. But if we don't filter that information, if we are not selective, then it would appear that everybody is bad. And that's what I find great about, 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 about Abul Fadl al-Abbas salam, that he during the time of Bani Umayyah during the time of that propaganda he was loyal to his Imam even in the last till the last breath that he was not susceptible to the propaganda he did not lend his ear to every mouthpiece he was selective he was able to see the bigger picture Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa alayhi Muhammad. You see, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, when I say he saw the big picture, what do I mean by that? He saw that here is a man, the grandson of the Prophet, all he wants to do is reform the ummah, and he's going to do it with a small group of people. And then there's the side of Yazid spreading corruption and vice. And that's all. That's the big picture. He didn't go into the details. Because as soon as you go into the details, it will start causing confusion. Right? He didn't give his ear to everybody. He had that basira, he had that understanding of looking only for that relevant information. And not focusing on the other details. Because that would only cause confusion to happen. Today, brothers and sisters, I just want to use an example. We have the situation in Syria. A great, a proud country, the pride of all the Arabs, Syria. Today is in total ruins. Total destruction. Bombs are going there, bullets are being sprayed there. One side is blaming the other side, the other side is blaming the other side. Victims are being killed here, victims are being, innocent civilians are being killed there. So what do we make of that situation? How do we process that situation? You know, some people take the easy way out. You know what they say? Well, they say, well, you know, there's Muslims on this side, there's Muslims on that side, they're killing each other, and the Arabs are killing each other. You know what? I want nothing to do with them. As far as I'm concerned, everybody has blood on their hands. They're all bad. I want nothing to do with them. That's an easy way out. Right? That's a pessimistic outlook on life. That you don't think that there are good people who are trying to make a difference. That's the easy way out just to say they're all bad. In fact, that's what people did. During the time of Imam al-Hasan al-Salam, there were people who said, well, you know, the people of Yazid, they're, they're Muslims. Imam Hussain al salam his followers, they're Muslims. They're Arabs, they're Arabs. You know, I don't want to get in between of this. Alright, you guys handle this yourself. I don't hate you, I don't hate you. I don't like you, I don't like you, but that's your business, not my business. And so the people sidelined themselves while the grandson of the Prophet was massacred. That's what they did during the time of Imam Ali as well. They said, you know, Muawiyah, he's just uh, looking to avenge the blood of his cousin. He's a companion of the Prophet. Imam Ali, he's also the companion of the Prophet. Well, you guys, uh, keep it to yourself. <laughs> right? We'll stay out of it. That's the coward way. That's the easy way out. That's not the way of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. Right? He was also faced with that propaganda. He was also faced with these diverging views. But he still stuck with Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. And is, that is the reason 
why we admire him, why we love him so much, that he was able to see through the propaganda of Bani Umayyah, he was able to see the bigger picture, and we love him not just because he's courageous in the battlefield, but he was courageous in making a decision and being firm on that decision. We love him not, because, not just because he had a sharp vision in the battlefield, but he had a sharp vision to see through the thick fog. To be able to selectively take information and to see the big picture at hand. And not to waver even for a moment. That is the example of Ul Fadl al-Abbas. And that's what we need today. It's very easy to sideline ourselves. It's, it's, it's very easy to take that neutral position. Right? And I'm just using Syria as an example. Right? It's very easy to say, well, you guys, you know, keep it to yourself. I don't want nothing to do with it. That's an easy way out. But the way of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, the way of those who followed Imam Hussein, is to make a decision, it's to take a side. And once you've taken the side, of course, making sure you're diligent in your uh, investigation, after you've taken your side, to be firm and not to waver. And that's what we need today. We need Muslims who are proactive, who are not, who don't sideline themselves, who are at the forefront. Sallallahu Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. I see my time is running out. I have a little bit more material, but uh, uh, maybe for some other time. Sallu ala Muhammadun wa ala Muhammad. You know that in uh, Ziyat al Warisa, we you have that line at the end where we we all read, right? That line, Ya laytani kuntu ma'akum. What does that mean? I oh I wish. I wish I could be with you guys, meaning with the shuhada of Karbala. Right? In hindsight, it seems very easy. You know, we're, we're thinking to ourselves that, you know, if we were in Karbala today, oh man, we would be just like Hur. We would be just like Zuhair. Hmm? We, would, we would just be like them. We would not uh, waver even for a moment. It's very easy to say that now. But back then, it was not easy. It was difficult. Right? And the only way if you want this prayer of yours that you recite every Thursday or every day, that Ya Laytani Kuntu Ma'akum, that you're in a way indirectly praying to God, I wish, you know, this desire, I wish you gave me that opportunity to be with them. I would have succeeded with a great success. If you want this prayer, this desire to turn into reality, we need to follow the example of Abu Fadl al Abbas. We need to make sure that when we are confronted with all of this information, that we are first selective, that we don't overburden ourselves with irrelevant details and information. And once we're selective, we analyze that information, we analyze that data very diligently. And then we become firm in the decision. And we've become firm like Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. So I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah grants us the basira, the vision, the piercing vision of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. That he grants us greater insights. That he grants us the opportunity to realize this desire to be with the Imam and to die alongside of him. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hastens the reappearance of our 12th Imam and he includes us amongst his close companions and those who die alongside of him. And that he forgives our sins, forgives the sins of our parents, of our friends and family members and the sins of the mu'mineen wa akhirud da'wana wa alhamdulillah wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi at-tahirin